Hey, B, how are you? I couldn't be much better. How are you? <laughs> we are quite well. Thank you. Uh, where in the panhandle are, are you here? Uh, I think you're supposed to be starting a program very soon at 830 at the Purple Iris, correct? I am literally looking at the Purple Iris, and their incredible cherry tree has started to bloom out in front, uh, which means that it's almost time to play outside. You know what? Your kid's just aching to get out there and play, JB. Let me uh, I can assure you that all kids are aching to get out there and play. <laughs> uh, so you made an announcement earlier this week. Uh, I'll say yeah. this. Uh, it, it wasn't exclusively on this show. Uh, but you made an announcement <laughs> earlier this week that you're going to run for governor. Let's talk about this. I did. My announcement was exclusively in front of about 350 of my best friends in Charleston. <laughs> um, so I apologize. I love you guys. But... Uh, but I had a bunch of people who wanted to be there with me. So <laughs> it was a great event. What was really cool about it is we made it sort of a family event. We had, you know, bouncy houses and blow-ups, and we did it at my, at my kid's soccer practice facility. And, you know, the idea here is that, you know, in so many ways our, our government is succeeding here, right? I mean, and you guys are living in the middle of, of an economic boom in some respects where we have new jobs and new businesses coming. You have Procter & Gamble here. we got Nucor coming in. Um, and just a, a myriad of economic development stuff. But unfortunately, the rest of our bureaucracy just isn't keeping up. And in so many of our core functions, our government is, is failing West Virginia citizens. And, you know, for me, my last six years, we've spent um, making our office smaller. We've reduced the size of our staff by 30 percent. We actually asked for less general revenue this year than we did six years ago when I started. We returned $100 million to the general revenue fund. Um, and all the while, we've increased the total audits we've done by over a thousand. We've made West Virginia the most transparent state in the country, and we've worked every single day to fight fraud. And in so doing, we've we've arrested and convicted over 45 people who've stolen money from the people of West Virginia. And so what I see is is a real opportunity for a change agent like me, somebody who goes to work every single day to make government smaller and better, to really maximize this opportunity for West Virginia because. For my entire life, I've watched these opportunities just slip through our fingers. JB, we've got some big names in this race for governor, including you, Mac Warner, Moore Capito, and others. What separates you from the field? Well, it's not about names. Um, what this is about is the ability to deliver results for the West Virginia taxpayer. And I know that sort of sounds like a, a political colloquialism, right? But and at the end of the day, we have schools that aren't getting the job done. We have infrastructure that's lagging, not just here, but nationwide, right? What you see every time we have an economic development uh, announcement is what's the first thing they say? How are we going to get gas and water and roads to this place, right? And, and at the end of the day, what that means is that we have a ton of people in West Virginia that are living with bad water, right? They're living with water. It floods every single time it rains. And uh, lastly, and, and maybe most importantly, we have a DHHR that is becoming incapable of taking care of those who need the most help amongst us. And so what I think we need to get away from and what we've gotten sort of um, conditioned to do is to look at government problems that government has to solve and say, let's just spend more money. Well, we spent $5 billion on our education system. We spent $7 billion on DHHR, and the federal government just gave us $13 billion to fix our infrastructure. And I would submit to every single person in West Virginia, and especially the people in the panhandle, because you guys are spoken to, unfortunately, by Charleston the least, something that I'm trying very hard to solve, we don't have a spending problem. What we have is a process problem. And when you have a process problem, what you need is a, is a proven problem-solving person, a leader, who's willing to stand up to the bureaucracy and say, we're going to do it different, we're going to do it smaller, we're going to do it cheaper, and we're going to create a place and a government that reacts to its customers, the citizens, the taxpayers, in a way that they respect and respects them. Make sure you, before you leave, you go up the middle lane of I-81 north toward Maryland just to get an idea of how the highways are around here. Uh, let's go to uh, Matt the Harvey. the middle lane the one they've been working on for the last 10 years? <laughs> About 30 years now, yeah. Uh, Matt Harvey. Oh, just 30. Sorry. That's I'm all right. 41, so I missed that. I missed that you missed the thing. first 20, yeah. Go. Yeah, that's right. Matt Harvey. Good morning, JB. You're, you're up here in the eastern panhandle a lot. I, I was just curious whether the auditor's office was going to have a satellite office in the future for the panhandle. Uh, well, in the future, there's going to be a new auditor, so I can't really answer that question, Matt. But what I will tell you is, is for me, the satellite office for the auditor's office in the Eastern Panhandle is me. I, I have chosen to run for an office where my district is the entire state. And that means that every single person that, that voted for me and the people that didn't vote for me deserve to have access to their auditor. And so we, I, I'm actually on my fourth car in six years. 
I've been averaging about 85,000 miles a year on a car. I've killed a Yukon, an Explorer, uh, and, and uh, two, actually two Yukons and an Explorer, right? And I'm on my, my Toyota that I have now. And the reason is, is because people here deserve the same access to their government as people do in Charleston. The government is located in Charleston, but it serves everybody. And so for me, it is incredibly important for every single person, no matter what part of West Virginia they're in, to have the same access to their government and the same ability to hold us accountable for what we've done. Can you update us on your Project Mountaineer initiative? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when I, when I was talking about making West Virginia the most transparent state in the country, that started with making our state government transparent. And then we had really great county leaders, people like, frankly, you, Matt, who stood up and said, you know what, this is great government. This is what my constituents deserve. And people in Jefferson County and people in Berkeley County, people in Morgan County stood up and said, we're going to do this too. And, and so we created these exact same transparency portals for all of our county and city governments, and we didn't force it on them. We said, if you believe in transparency, you believe in giving your constituents this unprecedented level of access to their government, stand with us. And you guys, to your great testament, and to our county and city governments around the state, said, this is a great idea. We're with you. And so what ended up happening is we have 45 counties that have signed up. We have, I think, 65 or 70 cities that have signed up. And they're all doing this willingly because we have a set and a system of local governments in West Virginia that do really, really great work and care about their constituents. And I think that is super cool. And the legislature's thinking about making this mandatory. Is that correct? Yeah, they are. And I understand why it isn't something that I specifically support, and for a couple of reasons. One, I'd rather have 51 willing participants than 55 unwilling participants. And one of those reasons is, is that when people are doing it on their own, I've already gotten 200 great ideas from county commissioners and mayors around the state who said, hey, I think I can use this technology to do this also. I can track how much electricity we're using in our police station overnight. I can figure out how much overtime we're using. I can figure out how to change the ways that I'm staffing parts of my office to save taxpayer money if I can collect this data. And so that's what happens when people are excited about something instead of forced to do something. And in sort of a, a little bit of a more mercurial way, the people that say no, uh, that says more than the people that say yes, if that makes sense. And as, as a, uh, a person who's charged with uh, trying to find those who may be uh, misusing uh, government funds, those who are less uh, interested in being transparent are certainly um, someone that I would, I would <laughs> be more likely to look at. Matt Miller. JB, in uh, all of your travels across the mountain state and, and seeing people and talking with them and seeing these changes that you have just talked about, how did all of that kind of play into you making this decision, I'm going to go for the top office of governor? So it, it actually played a lot into it, right? So I, I spent so much time traveling the state and so much time meeting with, with taxpayers and, and elected officials and you name it from, from every place around West Virginia. And what I hear so frequently is that we're excited about West Virginia's future, but we are a little concerned about West Virginia's present and the way that the government isn't reacting to the needs of, of, of people. And so what we've based our campaign on is this is the best place on earth to raise a family, right? We all know that because we live here. We see how our community reacts to us. We see what it means to be five minutes from church, five minutes from school, five minutes from soccer, five minutes from the grocery store, right? What you're really buying is time, and that time is to be spent with your children and your spouse. And the task ahead of us is to, one, tell the rest of the world that story, because there's a world of people in America right now who are living in these gated communities in Baltimore and Dallas and D.C. and you name the city, who are saying, man, you know, this place feels, if this isn't matching my value set. Where can I go to be surrounded by people that do? And that place is here. But the problem is, is that we have to, rebuild and recommit ourselves to the simplest tasks of government, incredible schools, incredible infrastructure, and making sure that those who need the government's assistance are able to get it quickly and able for us to do it in a way that is cost effective for the rest of us, right? And so that's our next great task is to one, draw people in, and two, once they get here, create an environment where they say, not only does this place have the greatest value set of any state in America, but they're meeting my needs as a young family. Child care, you name the issue, this place has it going on, and then the word just spreads. 
You mentioned child care, JB, and I know you wanted to address that some. I understand you might be talking about that a little bit this morning at the Purple Iris. Yeah, so we have, you know, if what we're going to do is say to the world that this is where young families need to come, young families have to be able to go to work. And in order to go to work, you have to have somebody who is able to help you take care of your kids. And we have two big problems in West Virginia. One, in, in large swaths of our state, there are no options for child care. The, the very rural parts of West Virginia, child care isn't available at all. And two, in places like here where we are growing, right, we, are, we don't have enough options. So there are child care options, but they're full. And you can go and talk to parents all over the Eastern Panhandle. What they'll tell you is when my kid turned two, we tried to find a daycare center and they were all full. And once you do get your kid in there, and my wife and I just got done experiencing this, it's $1,000 at least a month per kid. And in a state where the average income is not as high as it should be, you know, if you've got two kids in daycare, $2,000 a month right off the top of what you're making makes working really, really difficult to justify. And so, and, and, and when you're getting back to the sort of rural problem, one of the things that our teachers tell us is that kids show up to kindergarten and they're not ready to learn. And, and so what we have to do is create a system that, number one, supports working parents, but secondly, supports kids, right? They're the, they are the singular thing that matters the most. Everything else the government does comes second to that. And make sure that every kid has the same chance at starting kindergarten, ready to learn in a way that they can be ready to read at third grade. Yeah, and, and JB, I know you got to get going here in a second, but you know you mentioned the thousand dollars per kid for daycare, and that if you have two kids, that's two thousand dollars a month. That's twenty four thousand a year. But it's not that simple because you got to make thirty six to forty thousand to take oh. twenty four thousand home. So that's exactly what. So if you're making forty thousand dollars a year, it is, makes literally no sense for you to work. Because right. everybody would rather be at home with their kids, right? So all you're doing then is paying your entire salary to go for somebody else to watch your kids while you go work for somebody else. Correct. It's an unsustainable system, and, and it is one of those things that, number one, solves a huge problem for actual working parents today. But, two, it says to the rest of the world that this is actually a place that looks as children as their most precious resource and the thing that, the, that we need to support the most. And that is why all of my campaign will be based on first, how do we make sure that our kids and our parents and our young families are supported in a way that they can be successful and the rest of the world understands that this is the place where they should be coming to do that. JB, go have some Purple Iris breakfast. It's delicious. Hey, I'm going to. Say hey to the folks there. Matt, I will. Matt, it was great to talk to you, all of you guys, um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day and enjoy this beautiful weather. You too, sir. Talk to you soon, guys. State Auditor J.B. McCuskey, now candidate for governor. We'll be talking with him a lot more on the campaign trail as the weeks wind closer to the next election day.